Okay, so lots of questions. Where do we even begin? Um, I think we've heard a lot this morning about the immune system, so there were quite a lot of questions about that. I think, why don't we get started with that? Um, and I, I'd like to invite our panelists, especially uh, especially Maureen, um, to say a bit more about what is going on, you know, what what they believe is going on in the immune system. I think um, to make sure everybody's on the same level, why don't we um, explain what cytokines are, why we think they're important, what autoantibodies are. Um, Oystein talked a lot about these as well and how they're important, and all these different immune cell types and how they might be um, sort of dysfunctioning in uh, in MECFS. That's it's a small question, really, but um, <laughs> we can we can break it up a little bit across the panel uh, to try to answer that. Uh, Maureen, why don't you start us off? Well, with regard, is this on? Yes. Okay, with regard to cytokines, cytokines are proteins, and they are signaling proteins that are uh, excreted secreted from. Uh, immune cells, they then can be taken up by other cells and then tell those cells that they should carry out a certain activity. They can cause the cells to become activated. Those cells start reproducing, make more of themselves. And uh, they really are a key aspect of the immune system. That's why it's been rather puzzling when people have analyzed cytokines that we aren't seeing even more disturbances in their levels, but instead of uh, maybe the levels being different, what I showed this morning was that perhaps their relative amounts are not correct. There was a study uh, here at Stanford showing there is a correlation between the um, abundances of certain cytokines and the severity of the disease. So there is some evidence that, uh, that your levels do affect how sick you are, but we still need to learn a lot more about uh, what cytokines are doing and why they're doing it wrong in MECFS. Thank you. Um, Oyston, do you want to pick that up about audio antibodies? Yes, but, uh, is this it, this on? Yeah. Yes. Brief comment also, cytokines. I think that uh, they, uh, it's, when you look at the literature, it's very varying results. And because these are not very static proteins that are produced in the same amounts all the time. They vary by, um, by different conditions for the person and with the disease state and with the, the day, time of the day and everything. So it's very difficult to compare, uh, I think, uh, some of the cytokine studies because they, uh, they are the variability that's behind this. And do you want to talk about autoantibodies and, and uh, exactly what those do and why uh, you think they're going to be important for treating the disease? Yes, that, that's, uh, autoantibodies are uh, uh, antibodies that are produced by plasma cells that uh, are targeting, instead of targeting uh, foreign molecules like viruses or bacteria and so on, it targets the body's own self-proteins. And there is a number of autoimmune diseases with a known role for autoantibodies. And in some of these diseases, these autoantibodies may have a pathogenic role, that they are targeting a molecule in the body and, and, uh, and being responsible for aspects of the disease. So um, the reasons why we have been thinking that uh, B cells and plasma cells and autoantibodies could be relevant for MECFS it's based on observations such as uh, uh, the immune system so, uh, seem to be involved due to the uh, high occurrence of infection up front from, from uh, the disease, the high, uh, higher prevalence in women, three to four to, uh, to one uh, compared to men. We know from a study in 2012 that uh, there's an increased risk of B cell lymphoma in elderly ME patients, not something that uh, patients should be afraid of, but there is an increased risk compared to the control population, indicating that there has been a long-standing activated B cell system. And we know that there are immune genes that are, uh, uh, MECFS are related to uh, specific immune genes, so-called so HLA genes, which are also characteristic of autoimmune diseases. So, these are some of the arguments why we have been thinking. And, and then we have the uh, observations from the rituximab and cyclophosphamide trials that we should be careful in interpreting at the moment due to the negative randomized trial. But we will pursue this track further because it's so important uh, 
to find out if it really are, if there really is a subgroup of patients that may respond. If, if not, we should leave that track. I think that's an excellent point and actually answers another question that came up, so thank you for that. Um, on the topic of subgroups, Alain, you talked about these, uh, these subgroups that keep coming up um, in your research. Can you comment on how that might be related to these immune dysfunctions that, uh, that Maureen and uh, Oystein have seen in their work? First of all, they, there are different microRNA that are expressed by different cell types. So we did not yet explore that, but the test is available to the all MECFS research community. So it's just a matter to look differently to your own results. So maybe you already have the results, but because you, you mix the elephant in the same group, you don't see which cytokine or which one is belongs to one specific subgroup or elephant. So, so again, this is a, a way to enrich and see things that the noise is so high that everything is going in many directions. Now, by stratifying the patient, you can revisit your own results. Not, there's no need to necessarily to, res, to generate new results, but just to segregate them differently. And you may see a new path that you neglect or you overlook because the noise was too high. So that's why I think it's promising. I'm not saying this is the only way to do the uh, stratification patient, but so far it's the one that looks very promising, and I'm open to share it and that we can challenge and improve it. And, and eventually we will find what is the very best way to stratify a patient that can be clinically useful, but also useful to move forward research. Absolutely. That's a really important point because this has been a successful approach in, in a lot of cancers, for example, really finding um, what we thought was one disease, um, breaking it up into very smaller groups and being able to target therapies uh, to these different subgroups. And that's the idea of precision or personalized medicine. Um, and that's it's really been effective in, um, and life-saving for, uh, for a lot of patients. So do you think that um, the concept of immunomodulators came up in the, in the context of uh, of the immune system data. And um, Alain, you mentioned this, uh, this molecule thymoquinone. Could you talk a bit more about why you think that might be working or um, wh what, what sort of immun immunomodulatory uh, strategies you might need to take uh, to, to target these different subgroups or if there might be something kind of common going on there? And the then. simplest answer is the fact that we already work with thymoquinone on different projects, so we knew this is a uh, wonderful molecules, but we have no idea if whether or not that can work for MECFS. Right. So that's why we, we, we use it on the bioimpedance platform to see. We saw a significant decrease in the bioimpedance, but this is not a clear indication about which pathways is underlying this elevation of bioimpedance mm -hmm. and whether or not that will be enough to eventually even de design a clinical trial. So I think it's just a first baby step, yes. okay, to move on, say, it's a molecule that we should maybe pay attention, but there's a long, long, long way before that we eventually adopt the molecules and launch a, a, a clinical trial for that. Um, Maureen and uh, Oystein, I'd also invite you to comment on immu immunomodulatory strategies and, and um, which ones that you think might be promising for different groups based on your, your findings from this morning. So for example, with the defective cytokine-cytokine uh, sort of communication or the differential um, T cell metabolism that you were observing, um, does that point to anything obvious or? Frankly, I feel that we have to have a lot more research before we know what immunomodulatory drug might be useful. Uh, of course, uh, Oystein's working with some that modulate your immune system, but I, I think in general we really have to have a lot more basic information about the disruptions in the immune system. I would also like to comment about the idea of subgroups. Certainly subgroups exist, and I think there's probably a subgroup that might be responding to rituximab, for example, that uh, it would be a, a shame if those individuals can't get this drug that could help them. But going back to my analogy of that uh, uh, virus uh, doing a hit and run. So, uh, you know, uh, if you got hit by a car, you could have a broken leg, broken arm, you could have a bruised head, you can have a lot of different bad things 
And you would look like those are subgroups. Somebody's got, some, one group's got broken arms, one person's got a broken leg. Uh, but it's still the same car that hit you. And so I'm one of those lumpers instead of a splitter. I think there's going to be a fundamental disruption and it's manifested in different ways and that's why we have subgroups. And it is true that we may need to get those subgroups better by different methods, but I still think there's going to be a fundamental disruption. Mm -hmm. I see what you'd like to add. I think that um, uh, when we enter, entered the field, it was uh, from a clini clinical point of view and observing patients that uh, uh, reported benefit that seemed convincing to us. And these are the tracks that we have followed. And we, we will try to answer as, as far as we can if there are true drug effects that uh, have a substantial effect on the MECFS um, um, symptoms for, for these drugs that I've talked about. But it, I think it's important that um, our, one of the lessons is that using uh, the broad Canadian criteria, and uh, even though they are relatively strict and narrows down the population of ME to maybe 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 percent of the population, it's, you have, we have to be able to select patients better for who may have a high uh, possibility for clinical response in a trial. So that's something that we will, will have, have to work on. And uh, I agree with Maureen that uh, there's a not, lot of basic research that needs to be done. And f from our point of view, we, we will try to answer this question. Are there pathogenic autoantibodies? Are there IgGs produced by B cell or plasma cells that uh, uh, are uh, responsible for part, the, part of the disease presentations, at least in a subgroup? This is you know, an important, and uh, I think that also doing clinical trials has a lot of spin-off effects. You get the um, characterization of a patient group that you follow carefully over time. You have the systematic biobank sampling at, uh, at different time points during follow-up. So it, there's a lot of spin-offs that are coming out of, out of uh, clinical trials. So I think we hopefully can, can uh, continue doing that uh, in our oncology ward. ward. But we, um, uh, we will work to select subgroups with a higher possibility for response before any new trial, I think. Hopefully we can do a randomized trial with a cyclophosphamide trial uh, because it's, uh, the data should warrant that. But uh, we cannot make conclusions before we have uh, finished uh, phase three a randomized and placebo-controlled trial. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a, a note, and um, unfortunately Jared Younger couldn't be here today, but that um, last year his presentation um, on the neuroimmunological um, data that he had uh, generated about the disease was really in encouraging, and that um, we've also seen more encouraging immunological evidence from the speakers this morning. Um, can you all speak to the convergence of this evidence um, and how you saw connections between, uh, between your own research bodies? And I invite Ron to speak up here too. Well, the, the, all the research that's started out is like putting a big jigsaw puzzle together, and each of us has a little piece, and what we want to know is how does it relate to all the other pieces. Um, and uh, what's happening now in the research is their pieces are getting put together. There's still holes, but we're beginning to see things and connections and patterns. That has to continue. Uh, that has to continue to the point where we get a much better picture. And, uh, and, and, and that will help us in our, our order to find uh, treatments. And I agree with the concept of marine. I, I suspect this is, there's a central cause of this disease. And um, it's probably gonna be hard to tease that out. In the meantime, we should be looking for treatments and other, uh, other components of this that could help the patients. Uh, it's, it's kind of like having, uh, you have an infection uh, and you've got a bad bacteria in your gut and you have a headache and you have a stomach ache and you can take aspirin and you can take things to soothe the stomach and it makes you feel better. That's a good thing. <laughs> but ultimately we want to figure out what that organism is and get rid of it. And, uh, and, and those are always, the, the causes are always harder to do. But uh, many of the people are trying to sort that out as well as looking for uh, other components for this disease. Um, so we're, we're making progress of putting this jigsaw thing together. Other comments about the connections between uh, 
what was presented this morning and neuroimmunology, perhaps. I'm going to actually transition that into a question that was directed towards one of, one of my talks, uh, or one of my talks, my talk, um, one of my slides. Um, so the, the question was um, what cells we're, we're planning to use in uh, stem cell research uh, to study MECFS, and I think that speaks to the neuroimmunology uh, component of it. Um, so what uh, I didn't have time to really get into this morning is that um, the microglia uh, cells, um, which is some of the work that Jared Younger had presented um, last year, uh, they do seem to be playing a really important role in neuroinflammatory and neurodegenerative diseases. Um, it seems that they get sort of aberrantly activated in some of these diseases, and instead of um, playing then the protective role that they and the astrocytes, so these are the star-shaped cells in your brain that make up more than half of your central nervous system, um, they get uh, the sort of apparently activated in many of these diseases. And so, um, and then they start actually attacking the neurons instead of uh, protecting them. And we're not really sure exactly why that happens, but it seems to be happening in Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, evidence is emerging. Um, and so uh, we have protocols to make all of these different cell types uh, at our institute um, out of uh, patient stem cells. And so we're, we're starting to look at this in multiple sclerosis, um, which is uh, what I'd shown with those sort of uh, mini brains um, earlier. But I do think that could be an interesting avenue um, for CFS as well. We, again, we don't know if this mechanism is at play, but I think there's, there's a lot of the basic biology that we uh, still need to understand as, uh, as our speakers all alluded to. Um, so I think the, another interesting concept that was brought up um, by Maureen's talk was the idea of the foolish virus versus the genius virus um, that's associated with, uh, with MECFS and, uh, and the genius virus that sort of uh, hides itself a little bit. Um, so can you, can you speak to um, the role of EBV as a genius virus and how that, uh, how that might be um, causing causing these widespread effects in a way that's sort of smarter than what the other viruses tend to do. Did you say EBV? Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay, so as you know, this disease one at one time was referred to as chronic EBV, but what I think with regard to EBV is that um, it's, uh, most people are having a reactivation of their, almost all of us are infected with EBV when we're very young. And what I think was happening is a reactivation of the virus because the immune system's disrupted, we can no longer control that uh, infection. Now, it's also true that people report that they got mono and then they got this disease. That doesn't mean that EBV is causing the disease because EBV is messing up your immune system. What if another virus comes along when you've got, when you've got mono and now the two of them together are causing this disease? Uh, so there could be a percentage of people who have mono who also get something else and that ends up with MECFS. So with regard to uh, viruses hiding, it's, uh, even with all our new technology, it's very hard to find viruses uh, after, you've, uh, after the acute infection. So uh, if, you, if you get polio uh, and, I, and uh, the people who got polio in the 50s, if you were to look with modern techniques several weeks after to find, try to find the polio virus, after they're paralyzed, you won't be able to find it, even with modern techniques. So it's really, uh, it's really tricky to identify a virus that might have gotten you and is no longer there. It's also very tricky to find a virus that might be in your brain in just a few cells and, and, and is a reservoir that, that, that we can't identify. So, so whether there is a virus present is going to be very tricky to figure out. But one thing about analyzing the immune system and doing more thorough analysis is that viruses, the immune system has ways of dealing with viruses. And we may, by, learn, by studying uh, the immune system more, see a signature of your body fighting against a virus. And if that's the case, that'll be very interesting. But of course, we're also going to possibly see signature of your your body fight, fighting against these chronic infection viruses that we all have, like EBV and some of the other herpes viruses. Anybody want to add to that? It's clear that during the DNA methylation profiling, we saw that about one third of candidate genes that are hypermethylated, and those genes are necessary for your defense against <coughs> viruses and bacteria. 
So again, we need to further explore what exactly is the role and now to check in di different immune cells if uh, to, to what extent the defense is gone or maintained. So again, this is another way of convergence to make sure that we are moving forward with the field. Um, I could add a little bit in the sense that um, we do see a lot of uh, young people, high school, college students who come down with mononucleosis, which is caused by EBV virus. Uh, it's it's a pretty common to uh, have them convert to MECFS. And uh, uh, some studies say it's about 10%. Uh, and so it'd be really good to have a research project looking at that conversion. And that might tell us a lot about what's happening, including is there another virus present? Uh, looking at that very beginning of the disease might tell us a lot. And uh, that's something that should be done. Kind of hard to do, but it should be done. So some of the major questions that we've been trying to address um, you know, in the last three days when we've all been together and then, and then um, just generally as a community is the question of, you know, sort of who's vulnerable to the disease um, and what mechanisms are, are leading to, um, to the symptoms that we observe. So I would invite the speakers to talk about um, how the results we've seen this morning. How do these um, Im immunological mechanisms and the metabolic um, alterations and genetic issues seem to be leading to the specific um, symptoms that we observe in the disease? And how are they specifically pre preventing recovery in such a huge proportion of patients since recovery rates are so low? I, I think through provocation studies, we can learn a lot because you provoke in a very standardized way, for, for instance, post-secretional malaise, and you see some very specific symptom that you induce, and now you can follow about, okay, you have more brain fog, so vertigo, so how can we explain that? And we look at different panel of molecules that suddenly show up after the stimulation. So this is the way that we pick up thrombospondin one, and this is a molecule, a multifunction molecule is acting through different receptor that can not only explain potentially brain fog through its vasoconstrictive action, but could also mod modulate the properties of uh, red blood cells, eventually can also lead to more fatigue. So, and because this is a molecule that, that simply triggered by stress, oxidative uh, stress as well. So I, I would say at this stage is a promising suspect that we need to follow carefully. But now if it's true, we can eventually go back through in vitro methods and try to block by different ways and, and, and relieve the symptom and eventually we will translate that uh, in patients uh, and see if through, through the same stimulation we can now block brain fog. That would be a, a first step. That would take some time because that would take some fundings, but I think we are more engaged to what a more specific mechanism for one key symptom. Well, I just want to add something uh, that you'll see uh, throughout all these talks, and that is uh, from the standard of a lot of research, um, they're not using as many patients as they probably should. Um, and uh, that, that people will feel they're not analyzing everything that they could analyze. And that's all due to funding. And, and it really frustrates the researchers. Uh, they would like to do 50 patients and they have enough funding to do 15. And this comes up all the time and at our research meeting in the past three days. It comes up over and over and over again. And you're stuck with it. And you, you realize there's some, some potential compromises in using small data sets and you have no choice and you go forward anyway. So that's one of the frustrations we all face and some people will look at it from the outside, well that's not very good research. Yeah, the reason is because it's not funded. <laughs> so uh, th that's a re a really frustrating for all of us and uh, across the board. And um, uh, we have to solve that and we have to solve it. And right now the patients are stepping it up and really appreciate that because uh, so much of the funding comes from 
uh, patients and patient advocates and caregivers and so forth. But we also have to get uh, NIH, and I love uh, Maureen's courageous talk about, and she's spot on, this is exactly what the problem is. And I'm really glad that she will call a spade a spade. <laughs> <laughs> Maureen, do you want to add to that? Well, I, I think that uh, there are, we are going to identify, uh, when I say we, I mean the research community, is probably going to identify some susceptibility genes that make it more likely that you're going to get these, this disease. But I think that uh, a lot of us are at risk. It's, it's not just a few people. And one thing that's a danger is we don't want people to think this is a genetic disease. It's not a genetic disease. It requires uh, not, not only susceptibility, but exposure to something else. And I think a good model of this is polio. I once asked a polio researcher, I said, you know, why is it when polio was out there, 100 people would actually get polio and they would feel like they had a cold or they, you know, a little bit off, um, something mild, but then 1 to 2 percent of them became paralyzed. And I said, why is it? What do we know? And even to this day, we don't know why people are susceptible to polio. But he said to me, I think it's, sometimes it's just bad luck. He says, I think sometimes maybe somebody bumped their elbow, the polio virus that was there traveled into their brain and paralyzed them. So it could be bad luck that many of you have this disease because you got one or two viruses, your immune system was messed up, and it, it, you, you then wind up with ME-CFS. Would you like to add something? Uh, you, you asked uh, who are vulnerable and why. Uh, that was the question. Uh, so, um, and like Maureen said, we know that there, there are, uh, there's a familiar disposition for, for MECFS. And in some families, you have two affected. In other families, you can have several affected members. And, and uh, I think that there may be several predisposing genes out there. But as Maureen said, it's not the cause of the disease, but it's a predisposing factor that they need something else to, to, to get ill. We have been trying to look at families with uh, high occurrence and of MECFS, uh, often with debut very early in children, in several uh, brothers and sisters in the same family, and running in several generations, and trying to do sequencing of the genes to see if we can find specific genes that seem to follow follow the disease. It's not easy because you don't know if, uh, because it's not a genetic disease, you don't know if those that are healthy may still be carriers for that predisposing factor. So it's a not a very easy thing to do. What we know is that, uh, uh, I think that in a research uh, meeting, uh, several of the, of the, um, of the researchers tells, tells that there's a high occurrence of autoimmunity in first degree relatives of uh, affected uh, MECFS patients. And that's something that we have seen and was reported by Dan Peterson also, that it seems to be uh, higher than in the general population. That could be one clue that there's something in the immune system that has a genetic predisposition and uh, then a triggering effect on top of that. And a final question. On the topic of vulnerability, um, there was a question about, you know, if even though the disease is now endemic, um, as, as Maureen uh, pointed out, um, is there a reason that we're not still observing uh, local epidemics and uh, sort of outbreaks um, since the uh, earlier ones in the 80s? Well, although we're not observing these large outbreaks involving hundreds of people, it's still conceivable that there's some small outbreaks that we don't know about. Uh, I was saying to somebody, maybe everyone ate at the same restaurant one day, and then you know they got something, and they they become ill uh, a week later, and then all those people went to the restaurant, go to a different doctor, and the doctor then doesn't recognize that uh, there's actually a lot of people who went ate at that restaurant who were ill, and uh, so it's still possible there's some small uh, cluster outbreaks, but. It is interesting to me that there hasn't been another large one, and I do feel that that's because whatever these viruses are, uh, uh, a lot of people have immunity to them. Just like polio, uh, a lot of people uh, got polio, then became immune before the d days of the vaccine, and so there was uh, only a small group of people who were susceptible who then ended up with the disease. 
think that, yeah, important point. And this, uh, Dan Peterson also had uh, had addressed that issue of mobility and people, you know, not going to see the same physician necessarily. So the model of medical care is now a little bit different than maybe it was in the 80s, and that's why we're not picking that up. Okay, great. So we're now going to break for lunch. I'd like to thank again all of our morning speakers and our panelists for the discussion.